everyone. I'm so happy that you're joining us for our brand new video cast, Bespoke Conversations. I'm Nikki Sims and I'll be your host as together we throw some light on some of the key issues affecting women both closer to home and across the world. We'll be hearing the inside track from some incredible women who are changing the story for others in their day-to-day -day lives. Our conversations will also touch on some sensitive issues at times, some of which may trigger past trauma or painful experiences. Today's conversation will touch on the area of racism and Grenfell. I'm joined today by Swazi McCallie, BBC Radio 1 Extra presenter and the founder of Too Much Source, an annual exhibition showcasing the talents of black British creatives. Swazi also hosts The Last Supper Club. So, are you ready to be inspired, informed and invested? Let's see what Swazi has to share. Swazi, welcome to Bespoke Conversations. I'm so happy you're here. Me too, man. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I cannot wait for this. Now, my four-year-old daughter, when she finished preschool, she was asked to hold up what she wanted to be when she grew up. And there were a long line of kids and they had things like unicorn, princess, doctor, all of these careers. And she held up bus driver yes and yes. it just um it begs me to think when you you know little girl swazi what were your childhood dreams oh my gosh little swaz what did i dream about <laughs> I, I just wanted to be on stage you know i just loved it i just i come from a big big family loads of cousins yeah lots of karaoke okay. so really i was always like i want to get into tv um i never knew how to but actually I really enjoyed being on stage. So whether that was theater stuff through poetry or just being, I don't know, doing silly karaoke bits with the cousins, it was all right for me. But yeah, not a bus driver though, although shouts to the bus drivers. Yeah, come on, yeah. come on. Absolutely. So born performer, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Great. Uh, now I want to go straight into some issues surrounding women because mm -hmm. that's what we're all about here at Bespoke Conversations. And one of the issues that hits the headlines so often is the issue of safety. We can all call to mind names like Sarah Everard, who just through simply walking home is tragically no longer with us. Um, thinking about you and your childhood and growing up, was there a time where you specifically be, became aware of the risks and dangers of being a woman? Yeah, definitely. I think even even now, sometimes I'm, I'm doing jobs, I get into one cab that's been booked, I say, yo, do I know the driver? Do I know where we're going? Yeah. Oftentimes I don't even get the address, I'm just said, this is the driver, look out for so-and-so. But when I was about 14 years old, I played goal attack in the netball team, so shouts goes out. I, I didn't say I was any good, but I just said I played goal attack, so <laughs> goal attack. And shouts to my girl Dorcas, we used to be on. Dorcas was amazing, she was really, really good. And so we walk home together. My mum's at work, like we're just going home. No one's picking us up from school, so we're going home. And Dorcas is yappa, yappa, yappa. Dorcas talking about the game, we've probably won at this point. So she's talking, talking, and we're wearing our skirts, wearing our blazers over our skirts. We've got the PE kit on. And we're walking, and it's about half four, and it's dark. Like okay. London, it gets dark real quick. Yeah. So we're walking now, Dorcas lives maybe four roads down from where I live. So I get off first and then she walks a little bit further. But Dorcas is guffing away, talking, talking. <laughs> Next thing I know, there's a guy walking behind us. I'm like, oh, he's trying to cross in front of us. So we cross the road. Yeah. Thinking, okay, yeah, he's going to go straight in front. He crosses the road. I said, oh, okay. my, he's, he's, he's crossing the road. I said, no problem. Dorcas, oblivious. Cross the road again. <laughs> Dorcas is still on netball, whatever the score is across the road again. This man now crosses again. To this point, I've checked out of the conversation. Yeah. And the more we're walking and talking, the closer and closer my house is getting. And I'm thinking, yo, if I stop in front of my house, if I put my key in my front door, this brother's gonna know where I live. Could never be me. So now we stop outside my house on the opposite side of my road and there's a blue van, a massive, massive blue van. And I just pulled Dorcas and I just said, let's just stop, let's just stop. Yeah. And I thought, right, He's gonna walk right in front and I'm waiting to see the back of his head past this van. And as I poke my head through the van, his head pokes on the other side. I said, Dorcas, let's go. Grab Dorcas, run right to the end of the road. Wow. And I just thought my legs, I've never run so fast in my life. And I was genuinely waiting for someone to grab the back of my blazer and pull me and Dorcas back. And I thought it was a wrap. 
by God's grace alone, we made it to the end of the road. There was a church there where my mum's friend used to work. She used to do a youth group. And so we're bang, 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 bang on the door. She opens the door. We're safe. When I turn back, this guy is nowhere to be found. But I just thought, hold on a minute. What on earth was going to happen just there? Yeah. What, what was he going to do? Pick me up? Right. What was he going to do? Like, kidnap me? And that reality suddenly became so real. Mm -hmm. Every netball game, we're getting changed. We're getting changed into tracksuits and joggers and whatever else we need to pace. Because you just think, oh, it's not, it's not safe. And that's 14 years old. To be honest with you, the most recent story, I got put on a tour, worked for the BBC, loved my job, was doing a, a, a school run, yeah. got sent to Blackpool. Shouts to Blackpool, never been to Blackpool before. <laughs> Love what's going on in Blackpool, the rides, everything, all of that is cool. Get off the train about Sunday night, nine o'clock, pitch black again. Ball my case. I had my hair done, braided up. I was looking nice. cute. I'm glad cute, to cute, know cute, 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 cute. So I'm looking cute, I get out of Blackpool, right? And there's no cab, there's no Uber. Who knew, no Uber in Blackpool, anyway. <laughs> So I really had to be calling Blackpool taxi rank or whatever. Yeah, yeah, can I, can I get a cab, please? He said, no problem. There's four or five white guys when I get to the station, all lined up for cabs. I wait in line. So-and-so goes up for this cab that's pulled up. Are you for so-and-so? Are you for so-and-so? I, I said, oh, my cab is first then. Fantastic. It's nine o'clock. It's starting to rain. Pitch black. I need to get to this hotel. So I pull up to the cab now. I said, oh, are you here for Swazi? He said, yeah. I said, brilliant. Open up his boot, run around the back of the boot, put my suitcase in. He runs around the back. He goes, whoa, whoa, what, what do you think you're doing? I said, well, you're here for Swazi and we're going to the hotel. He goes, I don't take people like you. <gasps> I said, wow. I said, I can't call my mum because my mum's in London. I can't call the BBC people because they don't know where I'm at. They, they, they haven't organized the cab and this is not a BBC thing. It's just what happened on the day. And so I really just had to take my case out of his cab and stand there and just think, well, what do I do? What do I do? Because the next cab I book, maybe he's going to say the same thing. Maybe I'm never going to get from A to B. What, like vulnerability, being a woman, like what is going on? By God's grace, again, this brother behind me, some Hercules looking brother, stands up. And no, honestly, he was, he was bare, like huge. He was muscly. White guy as well. And there's another cab that pulls up. And he gets in front of me before I'd even said a word. And he said, listen, mate, me and her are going to the same hotel. I don't want to hear nothing. You're taking us both there. Wow. And it's like, well, that is a wow. Thank you, Mr. Kind Hercules man. But also, what's your agenda? <laughs> like, oh, true. I don't know who you are. I've now got to take my bet and think, OK, well, lesser of two evils. I need to get home. I need to get to this hotel. Thankfully, he was lovely. He also paid. <laughs> It was only ten pounds. Let's not get excited, but like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? But, but at the same time, yeah, you are that's vulnerable. So true. Yeah. And so now, on top of that, I tell my colleagues, and they say, "Well, two of them say, so sorry. We're going to report it. We're going to report it to Blackpool. We'll do all of the due diligence, absolutely." But the other two colleagues said, "Maybe he was just having a bad day. Maybe what he meant." I said, "What could he mean? What could he mean? You do not take people like me." And so then, the next night, you just got to put that to bed. I've got to go to work the next day, you know. I don't have time to dwell on Mr. Cab Driver. I've got to get into work and get straight into the job. And that sort of rah, 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 just gets pushed down, pushed down, pushed down. Now, imagine that happens again and again and again. Yeah. You just often carry all of that. And, you know, you don't really know where to put that. So I think on your question of safety and vulnerability, yeah, from 14 years old, but right through to now, at my big age, I'm real still having to think about... Have I got my kicks on so that I'm ready in whatever situation? So I think, yeah, for women, we're often having to think about a lot of things that maybe men don't have to think about. And it's exhausting. It's very exhausting. It's totally exhausting. And I know that every woman in the room here and those tapping into the video cast mm -hmm. will all have their own story of where they've had to become aware of that, think it through, yeah. make decisions about where we're going, what time of night it is, mm -hmm. how we're going to get home. Um, yeah, I'm floored by that second story, if I'm honest, and I know that we're going to touch on this some more shortly. But before we do, I want to keep you there in your teenage years mm -hmm. because there was a defining moment for you that has framed the whole of the rest of your life and you describe it as the difference between night and day yeah now it's not usual to come to faith in Jesus in your teenage years mm -hmm. and I'm pretty certain from talking to you that you didn't grow up in church so 
We want to know this story. We're intrigued to find out how that happened. Yeah, sure. Yeah, didn't grow up in church. Um, went to church for Easter and for Christmas, but outside of that, wasn't really enjoying the Sunday school setup. I was like, yo, <laughs> my guy, it's not giving, it's yeah. not giving. So I really wanted to get out of this real quick. So my mum is from the Caribbean, she's from Guyana. Yeah. Uh, my dad is Mauritian and his mum is Chinese and then it gets very weird after that. But all of that, all of that led me to a point being young and looking different in school and finding identity and not often finding it well. Um, and my mum and dad divorced when I was young. I've got a younger brother as well. And so just growing up in that sense of where do I belong? Like I've got yeah. two birthdays, two Christmases. School's always a bit tough. Like just couldn't find my way. Yeah. And so shouts goes out to my girl Jazz. And we grew up together and we started shoplifting together. And not only did we start, we were pretty good. We were, <laughs> we're very good. Oh, you want left turns? We'll turn left here. I so. was not expecting that detour, but I'm loving it. So um, my mum's probably going to watch this. Sorry, mum. But like <laughs> all of this. And it was just this sense of adrenaline, this buzz yeah. of, and I'm not talking gold. Do you know what I mean? I'm talking Claire's accessories. I'm talking <laughs> H&M. Do you level. know what I mean? Yeah, very, very, very low level but the adrenaline of of doing something and getting away with it yeah I don't know what it was right. it was just this like I just I hear you on that I, en I enjoyed it to be honest with you I enjoyed it until boss man caught me and I said how how did you catch me like <laughs> I'm actually good at this I've been doing this I'm putting in the hours and the work but I left the hangers <laughs> Not that this is promo for shoplifting, but I left the hangers in the, in the changing room. And on that day, I kid you not, he locked all the doors, yeah? He told all the customers, this girl is taking food out of my mouth. She's taking money out of the shop. And me and Jazz just no standing way. there. And I was like, yo, I'm exposed. Like, he's not even just telling me I'm wrong. He's telling me the consequences. And he's now on the phone to the police. I said, brother, if you know who my mum is, you think I can go home in a police car? I cannot go home in a police car, it, 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 it's, it's, it's curtains, I can't just go. But he's made everyone leave the shop, everyone's looking at me and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I don't believe in God, I don't know who God is, but really quickly I found myself saying, God, if you are real, <laughs> right. you know what I'm there, like, yeah, yeah. if you are real, get me out of this situation, I'll never shoplift again and I'll follow you for the rest of my days. Wow. Now that's a very churchy prayer. If you're not in church, that's a very churchy prayer. Take it from someone who wasn't in church before, now in church now. And I was like, God, if you are real, honestly. And, and at that point that I said, amen, the shopkeeper put down the phone to the police and he said, just go, just go, never come back, just go. And he opened those doors and I just said, I said, just go, let's go, we're going, we're going. But as I was walking home, I said, is there a God? Like, you know, it, what, was, what was all of that about? So that was like Tuesday. By Friday, a friend at school, um, this is actually quite emotional because Jazz is now my maid of honor. I'm getting married soon. She's my maid of honor. And Lissy, who's a bridesmaid, it was her mum that went to a church called City Gates in Ilford. So I'm yeah. East London, East London, East yeah. London. When City Gates, City Gates has got a youth group called Blueprint at the time. And Lissy was going there on a Friday. She said, would you like to come? I said, yeah, let's go. We go there, it's a testimony night. It's young people oh. going to the front. Okay. Ah, you see the Lord, the Lord really was bantering me, you know, he's really <laughs> got me on a Friday. So these young people are going to the front saying, Jesus died for me. These are the things I no longer carry. These are, this is the guilt and the shame I no longer have to, have to carry because there's a cross. And on that cross, you can hang all of that because instead of you paying for it, Jesus has paid for it. And not only that, he's died, he's risen again. There's new life, there's freedom. Wow. And I was like, you have to believe this stuff, otherwise no one is going to the front to just air their dirty laundry. Like, why would you do that? No, no you're out of your mind. Do you think I'm gonna go to the front and say, I got shoplifted, I got, like, <laughs> I got caught on Tuesday? No way. So I, I just, I heard the gospel and I became a Christian and, and I, I genuinely was just in awe that someone saw me that Tuesday afternoon and was prepared to then die for me without even me knowing who he was. Um, and since that, I, I don't remember like raising my hand, coming to the front. I had a lot of questions, a lot of like, what do you mean Jesus is the son of God? I thought it was like a fairy tale. I didn't think Jesus was yeah. real. I didn't know the conversation wasn't that he was a real guy. Like he, he, he walked the earth. We've got historical records for that. I didn't realize the conversation was no. Yeah, we know he's real, Swaz. Was he the son of God though? And that question hit me hard because if he really is the guy who he says he is and did the things he said he did, he's not just any person I've got to right. really take on board what he said and so yeah like became a Christian at 14 my whole world flipped 
flip, flip, flip. Had confidence. I didn't, I didn't need the cool girls at school to like me anymore. I said, I got new friends. I got new friends on a Friday. <laughs> I was out here just like yeah. all the things. Yeah, all the things I was looking for to belong or to be accepted or to do these things. I just, I just, yeah, it, it fizzled. It fizzled in light of the gospel. And so just started going to the drama group at the church and then got into presenting. And then lo and behold, I do it as a job now. And I'm like, God, you're so kind to refine, again, being refined as a 14 year old at drama and now on radio, things go wrong on radio, you know, listen, there's so many things. But when I look back at being at youth, I'm like, yeah, so-and-so might not turn up. So-and-so's got the tension. You now have to play the role of mum, dad and dog in this drama. Yeah. Just go for it. And I think all of the skills that I learned and really just had a, a joy in doing at 14, God has kept me all the way through. So. Wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm yeah. not going to lie. That is one of the best answers to that question I've heard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is good. And I think it's interesting, isn't it, that what you heard was he's paid it in full. Yeah. When where he met you is whilst you were shoplifting. Yeah. I mean, that to me, I love how God does stuff yeah. like that. Now, there's so much ground to cover and I want to stay there, but I also want to hear more <laughs> yeah. about the rest of your life. Um, you have chosen a career in the media. Mm -hmm. What made you think about pursuing that career and particularly radio? To be honest with you, I didn't, you know, I didn't really choose it. I, it, it came about because, like I said, I started hosting, started presenting. But when you do Friday night at youth, you never think, oh, this is going to be the job. And by the way, I came home and I was like, mum, I became a Christian. Like, I've heard the gospel. And she was like, nah, I'm not feeling it, you know, <laughs> like my, my mum was not on board. And so to reconcile like, oh, right, you don't actually... You're not rocking with this. And, and to find my identity outside of the home or outside of what my mum thinks brave. is, yeah, it was it, it, it was always a tension like that. But let me just shout out a couple guys. I know we're doing women energy and I'm here for the girls, but Ben, Chris and Aaron, my three homies, even like they'd be the brides man them, honestly, because yeah. those three kept me. And so I became a radio presenter because my fiance now was like, look, Kiss has opened up this job. So before One Extra, I worked at Kiss. And they had this opportunity that you could just audition and become a radio presenter. And so Chico was like, why don't you pretend to be a radio presenter? I said, yo, that's savage, but I like it, I like it. So let me, <laughs> let's, see, let's see how far we can get. So in Stratford, um, there's, a, there's a Westfield, there's a glass box. The head of KISS at the time was in this glass box. Bear team around us, the video guys, everyone. And he was like, just go, just go, just go. So I do it, do the audition, bat up one reel, do a dab, do whatever they need me to do. Next thing I know, they're calling my line to say, yo, you've made it to the top 20. Academy. I said, I'm a fraud. I'm a fraud. I don't know what I'm doing. So I turn up now to this academy and they're like, I thought you was a kiss presenter. And I was like, no, definitely not a kiss presenter. But did all of the rounds, did all of the rounds. And then in October 2016, they landed me the job of the new radio presenter to be at Kiss. And I was like, what? What do you mean? So that's the Lord. That's the Lord. But I say all that to say, like, all of the skills that like, at 14, I just threw into this radio opportunity. And yeah. so from then, went on to do some incredible things at KISS. And then as of, like, last year, moved from KISS, went to One Extra, and now do the breakfast show on Saturdays at One Extra. So loads of jobs in between, but definitely, if there's a whole time to talk about women and freelancing and all that that has to come with it, yeah. um, there are challenges. But, yeah, radio is cool. Radio is a lot of fun. The heart of it is storytelling, which is what I'm about. So, yeah, I enjoy it. It's a joy. Which is another reason why it's so good to have you here today, because, I mean, that was another epic story, wasn't it? <laughs> now, you've mentioned challenges mm -hmm. and beyond the highlights reel, beyond what we might see on your Insta, I know that for you, there will have been some serious challenges, both as a woman, but also as a woman of colour. Mm -hmm. And I really want to get into that. What... The glass box, mm. tell us more. Yeah, glass boxes, I don't do well with glass boxes and white men. Yeah. I don't do well with that because there is a real um, two way that happens where you're in the box and it all looks well, but outside of the box, no one can hear what's going on inside the box. Right. Um, and so just a couple instances and, and just quick fire stories. And I hope that these resonate because I think if you don't tell them, everyone is like, that happened to you as well. What's yeah, going on? We so need you to tell them. If I just reel the free the rules, it's like, OK, um, had one conversation where I joined an agency. The agency weren't paying me my money. The agency now um, are telling me we've paid it. We've paid it. And I was like, my guy, you definitely have not paid it. Because if I saw money in my account, I wouldn't be stressing your line to be saying to you, tell me, where's my money? 
And so when I got into this, again, a glass box, there's a white guy in the glass box who's the head of the agency, and this guy starts twitching. He starts twitching and gets really red, and I was like, I'm just here to tell you that my money is not being paid. And when he turned the screen towards me, I saw that all of my invoices said void, 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 void. Oh, and no. I said, why, is, why, why are they void? He was like, well, can't really do much about it, but it's void. And I said, no, you can do, what you can do is pay me. That's what yeah. you can do. But I didn't have the courage to say that out loud because he was twitching, he was getting a bit aggy. And I just thought, again, I don't feel safe here, but imagine you're, you're in, a, in an office, you know, open plan office, people are working and typing. And all I can think is if I scream, no one's gonna hear me. But ironically, take the glass box away. Often when you scream, in these settings, no one still hears you. So wow. had an opportunity where I was up to do another breakfast show at a different management and they called me to do the breakfast show with a guy called Alex. Alex is my dog, my homie, he's a, he's a cool guy. I'm in this room in another glass box and they said to me, Swaz, we want you to cover breakfast. When the breakfast guys are off, we want you to be in. I said, yo, is it? Yeah, cute, 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 cute. They said, we want you to come in and giggle. <gasps> I said, brother. I said, giggle about what? Periods? I don't understand. Like, what, what do you want me to laugh about? Like, I don't understand. I'm good enough for the job. Clearly, you see me that I'm good, but you yeah. want me to come in and giggle. And Alex is looking at me. And as well as Alex is well-meaning, he didn't know what was going on either. So we both just looked at each other and sat there. And again, I didn't know what to say. I was screaming in my head, but not out loud for the sake of people saying something so offensive but again, didn't know what I was doing. So you know what I did? I learned. I learned how to drive the desk, which is all the buttons and the faders. I learned how to do Alex's job because come two weeks, I was bantering Alex and giggling hard, but also doing all the technical thing to the point where the producers were like, oh, you can do more. In my head, I'm like, obviously I can do more. <laughs> but for the sake of the conversation, these things are happening. Other rooms, people will tell you, oh, because you're, because you're not white, because you're black, um, you should stop saying thank you. Can you imagine? Someone said to me, stop saying thank you. Every time you say thank you, you're half in your rate because you're grateful to be here. I said, if anyone knows me, gratitude is the brand. Yeah. I'm always saying thank you to someone. I can see that about And you. I was like, what do you mean? Stop saying thank you. So I just say all these things to say, you throw in a black pool at the end of the week, you throw in stop saying thank you, you throw in your pay's got cut, you're, you're constantly being told that maybe your worth isn't as valuable as the next person or because of the color of your skin or the way you have your hair or whatever it is. And there's no, so there's no way to fix all these things, but talking about them honestly bridges such the gap of silence. If there's no one talking about it, at least the next girl coming up is like, right, Swaz, you set pace. So the next time I'm in that glass box, I know what to be saying. I'm like, sis, don't go in. Don't go into the glass box. Come away. Get out, get out, get out. So no yeah. glass boxes. No, 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 no. I want to pick up on what you've said about silence mm. because that is so important for us to think through. But I also want to think about the time where there was so much noise. When George Floyd was murdered, yeah. it was amplified, this conversation. And thinking about you and what you have been through every single day, yeah. I want to know what it felt like for you working in such a high profile industry where these conversations are suddenly breaking open and you are working through your own lived experience and trauma. And for you, this is nothing new. Yeah. How did you get through that? Yeah, this is, this is huge. And I really pray that I would just handle it with such grace. Yeah. So uh, I was working at KISS and KISS predominantly is a radio station that loves black culture. They love black music. George Floyd, is murdered. We all wake up to the shocking video where your heart just sinks. And even to even to, to watch, you know, some people can just watch the video from start to end. Yeah. There are others of us that can't even begin to press play. And so now you have to then go into work and, and, and you know, have this conversation. And it came about where the workplace wanted to highlight diversity, highlight these stories, and was offering the, the space on radio to talk about places where we've experienced racism. And me and my fast self said, oh, at KISS. And they were like, no, <laughs> outside. And I was like, oh, as if like it doesn't happen here. And so bravery or not bravery, fed up or not fed up, I just said, guys, I don't really think that's a great idea. Um, I don't think it's for the job of us as presenters to now open our own worlds up 
and to share these with audience and listeners who may not take well to it, may have backlash, may have people say, what are you talking about? You've got a great job on radio. How could you possibly face, possibly face racism? And so I said again, which probably, by, oh, honestly, if I keep hearing saying by God's grace, by, because the amount of times I should have just been kicked out in loads of rooms, it should have happened by now. But I said, I just don't think it's the job of someone of my level here. It should be the job of the people at the top. Yeah, absolutely. And when I said that, I knew that on, and this is on Teams, by the way, the pandemic is a pandemic in. We're on Teams at this point. We're not even in person oh, yeah. to be, you know, people are on mute, I'm off mute. I'm, I said, I think it needs to come from the top. And from there, there's an, a, a, a great person called Steve Parkinson. Steve Parkinson is at the top of Bauer Media. Bauer Media owned Kerrang! and Absolute Radio and Magic and Kiss. Like, we are a, a, a family of network stations. He oversees it all. And so now he's caught wind that Swaz is basically saying, yo, what are we doing? What's going on? So he says, oh, would you like to have a meeting? I'm sweating, I'm sweating. I'm like, ah, oh, okay, cool, let's have a meeting. And he basically says to me, I would really love your advice. I would love your advice on what to do. And I'm like, hold on a minute, what, what, what are you saying? Because in that meeting before I said, reverse mentoring is a great way. This is me just throwing ideas. Let me throw it at the wall, let's see. Reverse mentoring, take someone from the, the, the lower end of your company. And by lower, I don't mean worthless or, or, no. or, or anything, but someone who is not running or making decisions. So Pair good. that person with a, a decision maker, those at the top of the business, yeah. and basically swap worlds over. Put your feet into their shoes and vice versa. See That's what you learn. That's so good. Me, I just went to bed that day, you know, thinking, oh yeah, that's a bit, bit of advice, here you go, like Reddit. He asked me, oh yeah, would you reverse mentor me? I said, not me, my guy, I wasn't talking about me. Like, <laughs> no, 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 I wasn't, I wasn't volunteering myself, but you know what? And where we land, people said to me, Swaj, you should have made him pay, you should have collected your consultancy bag, you could have did, and I hear all of that, and yeah, there is time and place, but genuinely, I was like, you know what? There's real opportunity to speak to this man who runs a business at such a high level, let me tell him. So you know what I told him? I told him about the glass box. I told him about the glass box. Yes, come on. My guy has a glass box in his office. Like he said, yo, white guys in glass boxes. I said, yeah. He said, okay, we need to take away glass boxes. There's no glass boxes there. When you're there in the glass, a couple years ago, you then have the opportunity to talk about it, like fast forward. I told him about recruitment. I said, where are you finding these people? They all seem to be related to people. What's going on? He said, oh, the pools of people that we're, we're recruiting from aren't the same people that you know. And I said, it's not even about the people you're recruiting, it's the recruiters. Are your diversity on your crew? He said, I didn't even, and genuinely, when he says, I didn't think about it, he's not mugging me off, he yeah. just, he just hasn't thought about it. And so it was very freeing to basically bring all of those stories of racism, all of those things that people are blind to and just give it to him for him to share. And so we went back and forth on DNI. Small Girl Swaz has now changed recruitment. We've now put this policy in place. This has got nothing to do with my radio job, you know. This is me thinking, oh, I won a competition. Little did I know that five years before I would leave, these things would be in place and God would put me in this conversation and that conversation, so. And this is something so poignant actually, because I see you as a voice and Bespoke Conversations is all about trying to help every woman to find a voice to actually step up and speak up in those moments where we see something that, that yeah. isn't right. Mm. Um, and you were positioned for such a time as this in that moment, weren't you, to, to be that person. I know that must have been so hard to do given yeah. everything you were internally processing at that time. Mm. But also to think of the opportunity to actually demolish some really yeah. awful strongholds. Mm. Now, I don't want to pretend that uh, so much has changed since that moment because the way I see it, certainly from the headlines at the time of filming this, we are still talking about the mishandling of a Stephen Lawrence case 30 years on and the glaring injustices and inequalities that are still there. So come on, let's have an honest appraisal. Yeah. How much progress have we really made and how much work is there still to be done? Loads, because yeah. white guys don't want to change. Right. It's facts. Like, whatever's comfortable to you, whatever works for you, and given wherever you may be, white people take up the majority of that space, when you're now the minority saying, actually, I think we should do this, it's not convenient for you. 
Yeah. So whether that's a church setting, whether that's a work setting, whether that's whatever setting, oftentimes you're up against changing things that are not convenient for the bulk of people. And so you're left thinking, right, okay, well, I'm going to go and do it over here then. And if you think you want to jump on, let's go. If you don't, peace out. Like, you're not going to wait. I can't keep waiting because... I then don't don't excel. Like I don't have to. I, I don't. I shouldn't have to box myself into this thing here where I could fly over here. Yeah. And so too much sauce came out of that. I know we'll touch on it later yeah, on, but too much sauce is a platform that celebrates Black British creatives yeah. who are making history today. Because That's often right. you see guys, you're like, you're doing so well, bro. You're doing so well, sis. But you're not getting the appraisal because you do not fit what is convenient for the bulk. You're doing it as a side hustle. You should be doing it as your full-time job. Like, so everything that is to do with change, I think has come down to convenience and comfortability. But it's very interesting when we talk about sustainability. <laughs> Oh, we're very comfortable about talking about things that when it is convenient for other people, we will change the leather in our shoe. We will change the amount of milk we will drink. We will change whatever brand. But when it comes to diversity and change, if it's not convenient for you, if you don't like it, if it makes you do something you're not comfortable to do or yeah. pick up a book you don't want to read, guess what? You won't do it. Yeah. Um, and I think it's into that conversation we have to speak. Right. Totally. And that thing of being willing to relinquish power, which is yeah. something that our precious Jesus just models mm -hmm. so beautifully. It looks like giving up yeah. that power in order to bring others forward. Yeah. So I have to move you on, even though we could talk more. There's so much more to be said on this. But I know that there was another really significant moment in your career and actually in your life personally that I want to touch on today. And that was the time surrounding the Grenfell tragedy. And my first question is, where were you when you heard the news and what was going through your mind? Yeah, yeah, I know straight away where I was. I was in Finnish Park. I was at my nan's place and I was on my way to work. And I woke up, imagine I'd, I'd slept, slept through the entire time that the fire had started. Um, the fire started in the early hours. And you know, when I woke up by like eight, nine o'clock, my nan's watching the TV saying, oh, that's so terrible. And I'm looking at this tower block thinking, where in the world is that? That's awful, like that's terrible. And then I see at the bottom, I see London Tower. I'm like, London? What do you mean London? Where, what, this tower is on fire. Where in London could this possibly, not one of the richest boroughs in Europe, right? Kensington and Chelsea. I said, yo, this is down the road. And I was like, yeah, 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 it's, it's, it's here. It's, I said, what time? And I just, I just, I don't know. I just flipped. I just thought, God have mercy on me. Just, it was another place of the world that just could never have been on London soil. And this thing just rose in me to be like, now's your time for your faith to come to action, Swaz. Right. Like, funny enough, the night before, I had just finished Martin Luther King Jr.'s autobiography, The Lord. So I finished this book, inspired by justice, about how this man, and you know, we could talk forever about MLK. But just this rally sort of like, something's gone wrong, you can't just ignore it, what are you gonna do? Grenfell's on the TV, you can't ignore it, what are you gonna do? So I just put together one quick WhatsApp chat with bare friends from church. Guys, have you seen this? Sky link, news link, BBC link, da 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 say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so one of the guys I see puts a tweet into the group, says, from Forest Gate in East London, there's gonna be a minibus leaving. If anyone wants to jump on, anyone is welcome. Load it up with donations, we're going to West London. I said, yo, my guy, save me a seat on the minibus. I go to work, all I can think about is leaving work to get to the minibus. So, I get down there and we load it up with like washing detergent. I was sitting next to a box of Capri Sun. I've never seen so much Capri Sun <laughs> in my life. Next to, um, I don't even know, surf or one of those things. And with so many guys have bought trainers, box fresh trainers, bought um, tangerines. Like the donations were very telling of what little information we knew about Grenfell. No one is going home to Grenfell to wash their clothes. No. <laughs> no, no one, no one's sitting there eating tangerines. Uh, do you know what I mean? Like, we didn't know that. We just went with the best heart possible. And so shouts to Adam, shouts to Alidor as well, A-Star, like we, we just drove. And this is now 10 o'clock at night, we're in the minibus. And genuinely speaking, I just felt this like buzz. I felt like something was about to happen and I couldn't 
quite put my finger on it. It was like the first time my faith got the chance to live this activism yes. that I just hadn't done before. Like I, 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 I knew what Jesus had to say about stuff. I just didn't have... I just didn't have the chance to do it. So we're in the minibus and fire brigades are going opposite to us and, and they're stopping in the road where we're high-fiving fire, firefighters and, and there's a glow over the bridge. And I don't really go to West London. Unless you're going carnival, what business do I have <laughs> going to West London? Like genuinely, unless I'm going carnival, I don't really spend much time in West. So I don't even know where Grenfell is, but it happened that the, the sister church to the church we was in the minibus with is, is Latimer Christian Center or Christian Community Center on Latimer Road. And it was because of those guys, we showed our pass and it was those two churches that said, yeah, we know that minibus. There was hella minibuses trying to get to the Grenfell Tower, but they just allowed us to pass through all of this traffic. And so we get there now and it's like carnival, like the street food pop-ups are there. The Sikh man is there doing wow. vegetarian curry and, and the other person's there giving yeah. up bottles of water. And it was just like this street party that we just landed on. And then round the back of Latimer Christian Center, there was a prayer wall. And Ironically enough, I don't know if it was if it was a joint effort set up by the community. I don't think it was a particularly, it was on the back of the church, but now thinking about it, there were so many people there. I don't want to just say it was the church that set it up, but we just had arms over each other, just praying for Grenfell. And I thought, yeah, cool, find Done Wicked, like, it's cool. And then I turned the corner and Grenfell Tower is still on fire. And I was like, what, like, but it was on fire from 1 a.m. in the morning. Like, how is it still, how's it still burning? And I just remember turning this corner and the, the shot of Grenfell on fire just, just captured me. So much Adam had to drag me, he's like, Swaz, we've got to go, Swaz, we've got to go, like, we, we, we've got to go. And I just remember sitting there, there thinking, oh my gosh, Lord, like, people really, really died in Grenfell Tower. They yeah. really, really died. And families to this day are, you know, grief and, and just everything. But to put your two hands and your two feet towards something. And then that was Wednesday come Friday. That sort of, what am I doing? What am I doing? And so I just went back on Friday. Friday, funny enough, Bauer had a, had a presentation. They had an awards night and they had invited me. And there was a whole hoopla about your seat swaz and your ticket and whatever. And I thought, oh my God, shouts to Nikki Trent. I love you, Nikki. Like, I gave Nikki so much ag, you know. I was like, I'm coming, I'm coming. And Grandpa, I'm not coming, I'm not coming. And they said, if you go, you might lose your job because it's political. Grenfell is caught up in the politics. And before, like, there was a big election, Theresa May, all of that, June the 8th. This is June the 14th. In that time, all of us, don't tweet about your politics, don't tweet about, don't tell no one about your politics. And now Suarez is going to possibly one of the biggest political things that could possibly be on TV. Yeah. And I said, if you want my job, take my job. Because people have actually died. And if I'm gonna choose between the two, I'm gonna choose this instead. And I thought, you know what? That's the end of Kiss for me then. Do you know what I mean? The glass box is still glass boxing, yeah. it's still there. So I go down now and I just volunteer and I find myself grabbing a chair, standing up on this chair. It's so crazy. And just organizing this, this, this beautiful madness of, of volunteers, of about 300 people, right? Bedding we need to do over here, baby stuff we need to do over here, perishable foods, imperishable foods. Just so, every donation you could possibly think of from deodorant to toothbrush to whatever it is, we just organize, organize, organize. And honestly, it was so electrifying to just put your faith into, into action with people and hearing the Lord all throughout today. One woman was like, you don't know who you are, you don't know, and I was like, you know what, I don't. Like, she was like, stop telling people to stop, stop telling people because we've run out of storage space. And I was like, it's true, man. And she's in my face pointing, you know, like, I felt like, okay, let me let go. Let me get off the chair, whatever. Next guy runs around and goes, I don't really know who you are. I said, neither do I. I don't know who you are. He goes, but we've just loaded up Shoreguard. We've just opened up over 10 rooms of, of, of property for you to put storage. And this woman now puts her hand back in her pocket and just walks away. And I was like, Lord, I don't know what you've got me here doing. But the miracles on the ground, there are endless, endless miracles of where you just feel so inadequate, but God meets you in that. At the end of volunteering, I had the opportunity to meet the most incredible people um, behind Grenfell United, the official group of those who are bereaved and the survivors and those who are local residents. And they are ordinary, regular, beautiful people who have turned government and politics upside down with just their ordinariness and, and their skill set. But when I look at people like that, it makes me realize 
Anyone can do it, anyone can do it. And so shouts to Grenfell United, shouts to those guys who've taught me a hell of a lot. Um, and yeah, just championing people who really to this day are still fighting for Grenfell. Um, and so yeah, massive love for them. I am just, yeah. I'm so inspired by that. I think we are all so inspired oh, all the by that. Man. And what I want to pick out as we head towards landing this conversation is this quality in you, which I also see in Jesus, which is being a bridge builder. Mm. And there's this moment where you are practically being a bridge into a community that is breaking, that is hurting, that is sitting in devastation and being a voice in that moment. And there was an amazing clip that moved me so much where you were interviewed by a BBC presenter and yeah. I saw you speak truth to power. And that moved me beyond measure watching that clip. But I want to think about that quality of bridge building too in what you've done with Too Much Source because I think we can't not touch on that. The other thing about a bridge is there's this sense in which a bridge lays down its life to create a platform for others to walk over. Mm -hmm. And I see that that's what you have done with Too Much Source. What's the heartbeat, just briefly, behind that? Yeah, the heartbeat is just celebrating people. Like, Come on. Black Joy, you cannot bottle it up. If you were to bottle it, we'd be rich. We can tell we'd this. We'd be rich. We, we can rich. tell this. Do you know what I mean? So I just think in the same rooms in which you're like, you clock guys doing amazing things and don't get the recognition, I said, you know what? Big old Carnaby Street, you know, big old Carnaby Street had one shop with no black people selling anything black in this shop. And I said, in this day and age, don't worry, I can hook you up with a couple of people that you need to be now booking and, and stocking in this shop. So we just put on a gallery. It's a gallery, it's an exhibition by day, and then it comes to life at night with open mic or panel events or workshops wow. or whatever it is. And it just tries to capture people doing amazing things, small or big, all the way through, that people can come and feel really seen and really encouraged to keep on going. Um, and so that really, yeah, is the heart to celebrate Black British creatives who are making history today. And we love that. Do check out, do check out the website and find out more and just get supporting what Swazi's doing because you're making such a difference. So I have to come into land <laughs> and I want to finish with two questions that I'm going to ask all my guests on this Bespoke Conversations video cast. Mm -hmm. And the first is, which woman has inspired you most? I would have to say... Auntie Queen Doreen Lawrence. Baroness right. Doreen Lawrence. Come on. Because, yeah, give her a clap. I have you watched this, Doreen Lawrence. But if there was someone in my career that I was like, I, I would love to interview anyone, it was, it was her. Just because she represents so much for our households, like strength and resilience yeah. and power and vulnerability, all of it. And then I got the opportunity to interview her alongside Keir Starmer. No I said, way. what are you doing in the group chat, Keir? And then, like <laughs> these two. That's and interesting. Do you know what I mean? Those two. There. And she just had such grace to say, Keir really walked alongside me. He represented me in the early days. He, and I didn't know any of that. And so I learned an extra layer of British activism, black British activism through her and her taking on Keir. And, and obviously politics are politics. We land where we land. But just her to say, no, actually I enjoyed and really, really valued your conversation to me. And, and she was like, what? She likes me? Like what's going on? But just to interview her, she's, she's inspired me to think even when it looks bleak and it looks dark, right. there is joy, there is hope, there is resilience on the other side what of her. What a woman, what um, a woman. And even to this, and it's not finished. That's the, that's the joke, it's still going and she's still in the face of that going as well. So yeah, I've got the, That is a the very good choice, a very, very good choice. Okay, so, I mean, you have a lot of words. I'm gonna try and ask you to condense all of those words into a really, really short motivational quote to leave us with. I've been thinking about this myself and mine is gonna be start where you are. Mm -hmm. But for women tapping into this who are wondering, and I've heard all of this and I actually don't know where to start or I'm so inspired, I have to do something. I can't listen to this and not be changed by it. What would your quote be? Speak up. Yeah. And that's just literally come to me now because everything that you've that. pulled out of this conversation is only been, and it's not to say you're not nervous. It's not to say that you don't know what's gonna be on the other end of your words, 
But Jesus spoke up for a lot of people. He spoke up for me when I was in that shop. Do you know what I mean? Shoplifting, like a like, like madness, <laughs> really. And if he had not spoke up for me, if his cross does not speak, if his resurrection does not speak volumes, where would I be today? So yeah, speak up. Speak up, women, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This has been episode two of Bespoke Conversations. Thanks again to the wonderful Swazi McCalley. It's been fantastic to chat to you. If you want to find out more about Too Much Source, head to toomuchsource.co.uk. And if you want to catch an episode of The Last Supper Club, you can find it now on YouTube. Big thanks to you for joining me today. Head over to bespokeconversations.co.uk to catch our future episodes. And if you want to get in touch with us about anything, you can email us at info at bespokeconversations.co.uk. We'll see you next time.